This is Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a production of Catholic Radio Indy. Now here's today's program. This is Faith in Action on Catholic Radio. I'm Jim Ganley. Our co-host is Bridget Ayer. Hello. I'm glad everyone's with us today. Glad to be here. And Bridget, this is normally the time in the program where we uh, bring people up to date on what's going on at the station and things like that. And believe it or not, we are having kind of a quiet time. We had our big dinner and silent auction a month or so ago. We've got a share a coming up in a month or so. And now we're just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> no, that's not true. We never is, twiddle our thumbs, do we? Oh, maybe is, you do, Jim. No, well, I don't think so, but <laughs> I'm the chief twiddler. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we want to thank everybody for all of their contributions, both for the uh, share and your regular contributions year-round. We are listener-supported, and we do depend on folks just like you to keep us on the air. So thank you very much. Well, we've got a great topic. Uh, I always think it's, it's amazing how quick the um, the the stores get the Halloween uh, decorations out. I mean, I think there's Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas right now, (laughs) but but we do have Halloween coming up. And, you know, I always wonder if if evil is ramping up during that time or if it's just maybe the times that we live in in general. But our guest today is an expert on evil. That that could sound bad in a way, but uh, (laughs) we'll, 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 we'll unpack that a little bit later. But joining us today is Father Vincent Lampert, who serves as the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And he's also a pastor of a church, St. Peter, a couple churches, St. Peter's and St. Michael's, the Archangel Catholic Churches in Brookville. So welcome to Faith in Action, Father Vince. Thank you, Bridget. It's good to be with you and Jim today. Now, last time I actually did an interview with with uh, Father Vince. I have a ho- I have a YouTube channel called All About the Grace, and we did a we did a long interview on on this topic of exorcism and being an exorcist. And I told him before we got started that his his interview had more views than Father Mike Schmidt's my interview with Father Mike Schmidt. So that was saying something right there. Well, we've had our annual dinners now for a better part of fifteen years. Now, of course, we didn't have a dinner this year because of the pandemic, but uh, of all of the past dinners, the highest attendance that we ever had was the year that Father Vince was our guest speaker. I guess there's something about exorcism that uh, people just want to know about. Yeah, so what what is an exorcist? Let's start there. <laughs> what is an exorcist? An yes. An exorcist is a priest appointed by his local bishop to investigate uh, possible cases of demonic activity in the diocese, and that could either be in a location, demonic infestation, or it could be with a person, and there would be three different types, demonic vexation, one is experiencing physical attacks, demonic obsession, one is experiencing mental attacks, and then demonic possession, whereby the devil or some other evil spirit would take control of the person's body treating that body as if it were its own, such as using their mouth to speak, their eyes to see, their feet to walk, their hands to offer gestures. So the exorcist is the one who has been delegated again by his local bishop to investigate these matters and, if need be, to use the official right of exorcism of the Church. Now, that sounds like something, you know, from medieval times that you uh, imagine people being possessed by the devil and driving devils out and everything, but this is... You know, like 2020, is that stuff still happen? And, Jim, that's usually what a lot of people will say. You know, in the Western world, I think we're oftentimes very skeptical in believing in spiritual realities. Oftentimes we may just reduce it to some type of a mental health issue. But the Church has always consistently spoken about the fact that evil is personified in what we call the devil and his demons, the other fallen angels. So, there's so many questions I have, I'm not even sure where to start here. Why don't you talk a little bit about yourself? Um, How did you become the exorcist? You are a priest of the Archdiocese, you have a past, you have a a parish, you were at St. Malachy for a a long time, Um, now you're out at Brookville. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself, and maybe how does one become the exorcist, (laughs) or an exorcist? Yes, I grew up on the west side of Indianapolis in the former Holy Trinity Parish, and then in 1991 I was ordained a priest 
for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. I attended St. Minard College in southern Indiana, the University of St. Mary the Lake up in uh, the northern suburbs of Chicago. And then in 2005, Archbishop Daniel Beekline appointed me to be the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. At that time, Monsignor John Ryan, who was the exorcist and the pastor of St. Anthony's there on the west side of Indianapolis, passed away, and then the archbishop was looking for a replacement. What's interesting is that the Archdiocese of Indianapolis has historically always had an appointed exorcist. Even when it fell out of maybe popular use in many dioceses across the country, Indianapolis always had one. So the bishop told me that he wanted to maintain that practice. He even admitted that he didn't really know what he was asking me to do, <laughs> but he did want to keep the tradition of having an officially appointed exorcist now, in the archdiocese. Now, when it comes to, uh, as you mentioned, the bishop appointing uh, a priest to be an exorcist, is that a case of... Uh, a whole bunch of priests saying, hey, pick me, pick me, or is, or, or is it, uh, don't, don't pick me? Well, Archbishop Daniel always used to tell me that anyone who would want the job shouldn't get it. <laughs> he told me the fact that I wasn't looking for it made me a good candidate. Yeah, it's but... important to say that the local bishop is the exorcist in his diocese by virtue of his Episcopal ordination. And then the Church says the bishop at his discretion could appoint any priest to perform an exorcism in the diocese, or he could point one or more of his priests on a stable basis, meaning this particular priest is the go-to guy, if you will, for anyone in the diocese who believes they're up against the forces of evil. We're talking with Father Vince Lampert. He is the pastor of St. Peter and St. Michael the Archangel Catholic Churches in Brookville, but uh, he is also the um, Archdiocesan exorcist. Here's a question. Is the devil, is evil real? Absolutely, and that's, the Church has always consistently taught that evil is personified. There might be people today that would say that evil is nothing more than humanity's inhumane treatment of one another, so that it's something of our own making. But again, the Church consistently has spoken about the fact that evil is personified. That's been consistent in the tradition of the Church in the magisterium of the Church, and certainly within sacred scripture. Jesus himself makes a clear distinction when he sends his disciples out between a physical illness and those who were possessed by demons. So the Church today still makes that distinction, even though perhaps it's not widely spoken of in the public forum much today. Now you mentioned earlier in the program the devil and demons, and I've always thought of, you know, possession being of the devil, as if, uh, you know, there's just one guy, but the demons, uh, there's a bunch of those? There are, and it goes to the book of Revelation. It talks about the sin of the angel Lucifer, archangel Lucifer, seraphim angel, highest in the choirs, that uh, when he rebelled against God, his decision to rebel influence one-third of the angelic choir to rebel as well. The passage in Revelation talks about his tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky, and that is the fall of the angels, which would raise the question, how many angels are there, and what is one-third? <laughs> yeah, good question. You and know? I think Scripture would tell us thousands and thousands and myriads and myriads, meaning they can't even be counted. Well, we all face temptations, and there's spiritual warfare in our lives, and I, I'm just curious, is there a difference between a temptation and spiritual warfare, and, and maybe maybe could you define maybe those two, t two things, and how, how does evil play into that? Yeah, well, I think the devil has a two-stage plan of attack. Certainly his activity can be extraordinary. Again, that would be the infestation, the vexation, the obsession or possession. But the Church also speaks about the ordinary activity of the devil, how he tries to trip us up in our daily lives through temptation. You know, he, he can tempt us, and then once he tempts us, if we succumb to the temptation, then the devil becomes our accuser. And then a guilt kind of sets in. You know, look at what you've done. You know, God can't ever forgive you for that. And so, uh, yeah, he, he tries to sow division because the devil 
would desire that we would make the same choice that he has made, namely to reject God forever. It's the old adage that misery loves company. Well, when you talk about division, I don't think our culture, our culture's in a, a big, <laughs> a lot of division right now in families and in our society. Um, you see the see the devil in that and it all? <laughs> Putting you on the spot there, Father Vince. Well, I think the devil is an opportunist. So if there's a lot of brokenness in society, the devil will try to enter into those cracks and to fracture us even more. You know, the goal of the, of the human person is to live our lives in such a way that when we arrive at the end of our lives, we can present our life back to God as something whole and complete. But the devil would want us to be nothing more than a, a jumble of you know, broken bits and pieces so that we really have nothing to give back to God. So if you think about it, Christ came to give us community. He gave us the Church. He wants to bring wholeness. But the devil is all about division and separation and isolation. So you look at the world in which we live today, there's a lot of people in isolation. You know, we're fighting the pandemic, and I think the devil takes advantage of that just to isolate the human person even more so that we give in to despair. Because ultimately, when we lose hope, we've lost everything. And Christ is the ultimate source of hope in our lives. We recently celebrated um, the feast day of the of the archangels. Um, what role do angels play in, in all of this, I guess? Fight against evil. I mean, this is another hard question. I'm, I'm giving you the hard ones today, Father Vince. <laughs> <laughs> well, God has given us the angels to, uh, to be our protectors, to be with us. Certainly we have, uh, each of us has a, a guardian angel. We celebrated the feast of the Holy Guardian Angels back on October the 2nd. So it reminds us of God's great love for us that he gives us each our individual protector something that we should never take for granted. And then we have the archangels. Think about, you know, St. Michael. You know, he's a great defender. Many people, it's very popular to pray the prayer of St. Michael, mm-hmm. recognizing that he's there to watch over and protect us. And God sends the angels again to bless and protect us because of his great love for us. Now, uh, Father, uh, most people, when they think, or some people, when they think of the devil and guarding angels, think of the kind of classic cartoon with the confused-looking person, uh, head and shoulders, and got the devil on one shoulder, the angel on the other shoulder, and they're both vying for their attention. <laughs> is that a strictly a cartoonish thing, or is that a somewhat real? I would say it's more cartoonish, because we should never put, you know, the power of God, God and the devil should never be on the pl- same playing field, because a... An angel and even a demon, they're still creatures of God, and a creature can never be on the same par as the Creator. And the reality is that if we're standing strong with God in our relationship with Him, growing in holiness and virtue, then evil is nothing to fear. We need to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Life as an Exorcist. Is it like the movies with Father Vince Lampert? So stay tuned for more Faith in Action. You're listening to Catholic Radio Indy, converting the culture to Christ through radio, featuring 100% Catholic programming 24-7. Do your friends a favor. Tell them about Catholic Radio Indy. Alexa, what's the weather forecast for today? Alexa, What time is the Colts game today? Alexa, remind me to pick up the dry cleaning tomorrow. Has Alexa become a part of your daily routine? Then make sure that routine includes Alexa, play Catholic Radio Indy. Catholic Radio Indy. Quick, easy access to Catholic programming 24-7. Just say, Alexa, play Catholic Radio Indy. Catholic Radio Indy. A deadline. Great expectations. Daily pressure occasional failure. When God is with you, feel free to say, bring it on. Catholic Radio Indy. 
You can hear the Holy Mass every day at 8 a.m. right here on Catholic Radio Indy. Welcome back to Faith in Action. I'm Bridget Ayer. Jim Ganley and I are in the studio with our Mass on. And Jim's, and we're talking with our guest, Father Vince Lampert, who is the Archdiocesan Exorcist. And as Bridget mentioned early in the program, we're getting close to Halloween. And it seems like there's something about Halloween and exorcisms that just kind of somehow or another your mind goes that way at this time of the year a little bit. And is there any connection, Father, or is that just something that kind of coincidental? I think uh, every exorcist would tell you that there is a connection. You know, the, the word for moon, luna, those who are impacted by the moon, the, the, the word like lunatic, and that's not meant to be offensive in any way, but those who can be impacted by that, even many people in the medical profession tell me that, you know, their calls go up during the full moon. What's interesting about October this year is that we had a full moon back on October the 1st, and we will have another full moon this month on October the 31st. So we will have a blue moon this year. You mentioned earlier the uh, kind of all of the COVID restrictions and uh, quarantines and everything like that. Has that had an effect on the number of people contacting you uh, about possible uh, situations that involve the devil when they, uh, I'm thinking that people have a lot more time at home to think about things that they're not out in their busy everyday life. Has that had an effect on your business, so to speak? <laughs> Is business up? I would, <laughs> yes. I would say yes, because I normally get about 1,800 calls or emails a year. And uh, during COVID, I've been averaging 50 to 60 a week. So some exorcists are publicly known, such as myself. Some choose to remain anonymous. And those of us whose names are in the public forum probably receive a higher volume of callers, if you will, because people, when they find themselves in desperate situations, are reaching out for help. Now, do you get calls from Catholics only? I have received calls, uh, probably half of my calls come from uh, Christians of other faith traditions. I also receive calls from people who belong to other world religions and people who have no faith background whatsoever. The Church views exorcism as a ministry of charity, so the Church will always reach out and help those who turn to her when they believe they're up against the forces of evil. How do people get connected to evil? Is there a typical um, customer, or, a, or maybe those are two questions there. How do people get connected to evil? And, and then is there, is there a typical customer that you see coming to you, uh, you know, in, in your experience over the past 15 years or so? I would say that, uh, you know, an exorcist will always try to determine what was the entry point for evil into a person's life. And that can be many, many different ways. There are some dominant ways that I've seen over the 15 years I've done the ministry. Ties to the occult, the entertainment industry, I think, is very big. Uh, We're going into Halloween. Halloween has become the second most popular holiday on the annual calendar, if you will. You see all kinds of people putting up decorations and haunted houses and whatnot. The devil can play on a person's memory and imagination, so when we get fascinated with these things in the entertainment industry or you know, watching programs on TV or reading literature on evil, we are giving the devil an entry point into our lives. So how should people celebrate, how should Catholics, I say, uh, how should they celebrate or should they celebrate Halloween? It's All Saints Eve, right? Is that what we sh- should we all be dressing yes. up as saints? <laughs> all Hallows Eve. All yeah. Hallows Eve, right? Yeah. So we are, uh, yeah, right the evening before All Saints Day. So I think Halloween. You know, ultimately, there's nothing wrong with kids. You know, trick or treating. Certainly, that will be impacted this year due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. But you know, kids dressing up as you know a cowboy or whatever, and going out and asking for candy. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's when we start to glamorize evil that I think that we've crossed that fine line. Just because we think something is fun and entertaining doesn't mean the devil won't use that as an opportunity to kind of get a 
you know, a, his foot in the doorway of our spiritual lives. Again, the devil would want us to completely become unraveled so that, again, we kind of lose our connection with God. And certainly glamorizing evil through Halloween can be a dangerous thing. What do you actually do during an exorcism? I'm kind of curious about that. <laughs> an exorcism is a very special prayer of the Church. So it's a prayer that's meant to bring healing and wholeness in the life of one who is dealing with the demonic. So if I were to perform an exorcism, I would certainly prepare myself. I would go to confession, celebrate Mass, spend time in prayer, determine where the exorcism is going to take place, it's always in a sacred space, and then I would determine who else is going to be present, certainly the one who's afflicted, a family member or friend of that person. I may invite a priest or a deacon. There may be even lay people there. I like to say there's no such thing as exorcism tourism, so no one's there out of a sense of curiosity, but they're there to simply participate in this prayer of the Church. So you don't. And then there is a there is a prescribed ritual then that's followed that the church has. So you don't perform an exorcist, you know, at, at midnight in a scary <laughs> house, you know, during a thunderstorm, right? That's exactly right. The devil does not get to choose where he will be defeated. <laughs> the church herself will make that determination. Do you usually? So the church is always yeah. Where in then control and has the upper hand when it comes to fighting the devil, and that comes from the power and the authority of Christ that he has given to his church. So will you perform this maybe in, in a church or in a parking lot or just... It will be in a church, in a chapel, in a place that's also going to provide some level of privacy. Certainly not going to do it, you know, in a church where people may be coming in and out for adoration or whatever. Right. Because, again, you want to protect the identity of the individual and also don't really want to scare those who might walk in yeah. when an exorcism is taking place. I want to get to two more things. What are the best protections against evil? And then I also want to talk about your new book, and we've got about six minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing for Catholics to do is, if you're going to Mass, if you're praying, if you're celebrating the sacraments, going to confession, receiving the Eucharist, the devil is already on the run. Other things as Catholics, we have a great treasure trove of things that we can do. We can read sacred scripture. The Word of God is a powerful uh, way to defeat the devil. Jesus did that in the desert. When the devil was trying to trip him up, he used the words of sacred scripture. Our Blessed Mother is a powerful ally for anyone who's up against the forces of evil, praying the rosary, novenas. Again, just the ordinary aspects of our Catholic faith will keep the devil at bay. Now tell us about your book. Uh, last time we talked, you were telling me you were working really hard on it, and you had a pub publication date, and so uh, it's, it's out, right? What's the, name of, what's the name of it? And it's got a picture of St. Michael on it. I just, you just showed me a minute ago. Tell us. Yes, it's called uh, Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. So uh, it's a way that I want to share some of the insights that I've, learned over the past 15 years in my ministry as an exorcist. It's an opportunity for people to know very clearly what the Church believes and teaches about the devil. A few years ago, I was giving a talk at St. Louis University, and uh, Father David McConey, a Jesuit there who had invited me, works with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn at the St. Paul Center in Steubenville, Ohio, affiliated with uh, Franciscan University. So he encouraged me to write a book. So during the pandemic, when things were shut down, I had the opportunity to find the time to do that. So the book was uh, officially released on September the 28th. It was made available to the public on the Feast of the Archangels, September the 29th. I had the opportunity to travel to Franciscan University to give a talk then to the students at the university, and then my book was available. Now, the title again is? Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demon. Oh, that's much better than Exorcist for Dummies. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there stories in the book, too, of 
I mean, of course, you would not mention names and specifics, but are there kind of um, stories that would relate to how people have been affected, uh, uh, benefited by exorcisms? It does. I share some of my experiences, you know, going through the book. I tell the story how I became an exorcist. Who is the devil? So that people have a clear understanding of that. I talk about the extraordinary activity of the devil, what an exorcism is. Uh, the right itself, how do people today play the devil's game, so how do people give the devil a foothold in their lives, the official protocol that the Church follows here in the United States, again, because we're in the Western world, the Church will consult medical doctors and those in the mental health profession just to have them weigh in on the matter. Again, the Church isn't asking them if they believe that someone is possessed. The Church herself will make that determination. I also talk about the ordinary activity of the devil. I give a word to priests on how parish priests can minister to those who may come to the office believing they're up against the devil. I talk about the best practices to fend off the devil, and then reminding all of us that the ultimate victory belongs to Christ, because Jesus is not a bystander. He is the main actor. And so Christ is the one who is acting through his church, through the priest, who's been called to do this ministry by his bishop. We have a minute left. Just real quick, how has this ministry impacted you as a priest in your faith life? I would say that being an exorcist has helped me to rediscover priesthood as a vocation and not an occupation. Priests today are are so busy, pulled in so many different directions just because there's fewer of us. But the ministry has helped me to really re-ground myself, if you will, in what priesthood is ultimately all about, and that's helping to bring people into a strong and solid relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father Vince. Father Vince Lampert, uh, exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Uh, you can get his book at www.emmausroad.org. Before we go, Father, could you give our uh, audience a blessing? Absolutely. I'm happy to do so. The Almighty God sends his blessing upon each and every one of you, your family and loved ones, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Father Vince. God bless you. Thank you. You have been listening to Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a presentation of Catholic Radio Indy. You can hear this episode of Faith in Action again or any past episode at catholicradioindy.org. If you have a suggestion for a guest or topic for a future program, please call us at 317-870-8400 or email jim at catholicradioindy.org.